All right. Well, we are into a series called Engaged, Engaged Series, and we've been highlighting various principles of engagement uh, in order to engage in what God has for us. And so this is part six in a uh, three-part series. <laughs> the plan is to be done today. All right, so this is part six, and uh, it's continuing on a subpart called Grace and Humility. So we've been looking at, over the course of the last six weeks, keys to engagement. <clears throat> that Jesus said, I'm going to build my church. Gates of hell will not prevail against it. And I give you the keys to the kingdom. So as we progress along, we're understanding that God's building something and he's using you and me to build. God's advancing his cause on the earth. He's doing amazing things and touching people's lives, but he's going to use you and I in the process. So he's given us the keys. And it's important, again, just a reminder that we've got the power of God to do it with, but we've lear- we have to learn how to engage in that power. And so God gives us keys. One of the keys that God gives, gives us is the key of prayer. And then God gives us the key of praise. That's why it's important, church, that when you pray, we talked about that even this morning after the worship set, that praise is something that you sacrificially do, but it's important to do that because when you praise, you invite God into your situation. When God shows up, miracles happen. How many want to see supernatural, powerful miracles happening in your life? That's not going to be happening by you. That's going to be happening by God through you, right? Right? but it it, it involves your engagement in in him. And so praise is important. The word of God is important as a key of engagement. God doesn't do anything apart from his word. Amen. He won't do anything apart from his word. He watches over his word, Jeremiah 12 tells us this. Jeremiah 1, 12 tells us this, that God watches over his word to perform it. What God says, he'll do. Okay, so we got we to gotta learn how to cooperate with God in what God says in order to do what God's doing. Amen. So it's important you know the word. Well, also we know this, that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And faith is what accesses the grace of God. Romans 5, 1 tells us that. So we see prayer, praise, word, faith, all these keys that we learn help unlock or help engage in the power of God for our lives. Okay, we've been talking about that. Then we've been talking about the importance of grace, what grace really is, what grace is. And we've described grace as God's unmerited, undeserved, unearned favor in order to enable us to do what we can't do for ourselves. You can't get to heaven on your own. So God gives us his grace. And the grace specifically is God's redemptive grace, which includes his righteousness. He forgives us. Not because we deserve it, right? You don't earn God's forgiveness. You don't earn God's righteousness. He gives it to you freely upon your faith in him. So faith is accessing the grace of God. Grace being that unmerited, undeserved favor of God to enable you to do what you can't do for yourself. That's God's grace. And we looked at last week, again, we looked at... um, the manifold grace of God. Let me just quote that verse again. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 10. It says, as each one, okay, touch your neighbor and say he's talking to you. Okay, sanitize first if you need to. As, he, as each one has received a gift, you've received a gift. By the way, the gift that you've received is the Holy Spirit. Amen. Now, specifically, there are different gifts of the Spirit that God gives us as the body of Christ. Some of you have the gifts of help, some of you have the gift of wisdom, word of wisdom, some of you have the gift of prophecy, some of you have the gift of tongues, interpretation of tongues, all these different gifts that God gives to the church, all right? But he gives them to us in order to minister it to one another. That's important. We're, we're, gonna, we're gonna highlight that a little bit more today. As good stewards or managers of that gift of the manifold grace of God. So we've got this manifold or this variety of graces that God gives us. Let me list them for you. The redemptive grace. We just talked about that. Redemptive grace is God's unmerited favor to forgive you and to make you righteous through your faith in him. By the way, again, all these graces are accessed by faith. 
These graces are available to every person, but you don't access the grace of God without the faith of God. Amen? Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. For by grace you are saved through, come on, faith. For by grace you are saved through faith. And it's not of yourself, it's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So we have access to this grace that God gives us by faith. That's the only way you're going to experience these graces. Faith. So redemptive grace is God's forgiveness towards you. Restorative grace is now your identity as a Christian. Hallelujah. You're now righteous. You're now a child of God. You have been given authority. You've been re restored back to God's original intention that God had made for mankind. Okay, what is Christianity? Christianity is a rest restoration project. <clears throat> Let me just help, you know, back up a little bit. Christianity is a relationship with God, but God already originated that original relationship back when he created Adam and Eve. <laughs> Does that make sense? We were, we were, listen church, before you got born again, you're in the hood, right? You're in the hood. You're, you're in poverty. You're, you're, you're in, a, you're in you know, a bad part of town. You know, there's, there's a lot of hurt, a lot of pain, a lot of suffering, a lot of wounds, a lot of, a lot of trials and go, all sorts of stuff going on there. In, in our life, we, we suffer through poverty and, and, and health, sickness and disease and all sorts of problems. That's the hood. But when you give your life to Christ, he translates you or transfers you out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his dear son. You're now transferred from one hood to another hood. It's called the godly hood. And now you're living in the house of the almighty God. You're living in his family. You're, you've been adopted into the family of God. Amen. So there's a restoration that took place. Sin robbed us of that relationship with God, but Jesus came back to restore us out of that place of poverty, that place of loss, that place of loneliness, that place of desperation, that place of sickness and disease. God brought us out of that and transferred us into his household, that we might be part of the family of God, God being our father, restoring us into relationship with him. Prosperous, blessed, healthy, strong, connected, purposeful, fulfilled. Amen. Those are good qualities. That's part of God's grace. God restored us back into a proper place of grace. We are now the grace race. Amen. Hallelujah. I like that. We're the grace race. Yeah. What race are you? The grace race. We're blessed. By God. So we got restorative grace, and now, then thirdly, we have transformational grace. And transformational grace is a maturing process. It's, it's God, God loves you just the way you are, but he loves you too much to keep you that way. So he wants to mature you. He wants to grow you up. He wants to help you, and he's going to give you his grace to do that. Then we've got empowerment grace. Empowerment grace is God's strength. God's strength in order to do the impossible. All things are possible to those who believe. Right? We've got God's strength to do that. And fifthly, we have God's provisional grace, which is his supply, that God will help us in our time of need. Come boldly before the throne of grace to obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. So, we've, so we see all these wonderful graces that God gives us for free. And that's what you need to understand. These graces are free. You don't earn them. You don't deserve them. You don't work for them. You have them. You receive them by faith. But as you receive them by faith, you walk with that. You work with that. You, you, you allow that out of your life. That's why Philippians tells us that work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Not work on. You can't work on these. You work them out. Okay? So that means that you receive the grace of God freely, but then you release them. You express them. You show them. Right? You reveal them. You work them out in your everyday living. That's what God wants us to do. So, so let me give you a verse of scripture for that. Romans chapter 8, verse 32. He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? So I want to highlight the fact that grace is free. Say that with me. Grace is free. Okay. Now, thirdly, God's grace 
is God's standard of living. God's grace is his way of lifestyle. That's the way he does things. And I want you to understand something very important because grace is something given for free. That's God. God gives his life. It cost him something, but it's free for you. Okay? You need to understand that. See, sometimes church religion says you've got to earn all of God, what God has for you. You've got to earn it. You've got to work on it. You've got to, you've got to obey all these traditions and rituals and, 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 and all these rules. And, and, and if, you're, if you're lucky enough, you know, God will spot you out of the crowd and, and maybe bless you with something. That's a religion. Relationship, Christianity is Jesus did all the work for us. We just simply accept what Jesus already made available to us by faith and it's free. And God gives you this amazing new life that was free. Are you catching that? So now you have this freedom. And so Jesus, again, if God gave his son, delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with us also freely give us all things? He does. He wants to. So the standard of living that God has is a giving standard. Right? It's a giving standard. See, in the hood over here, we have, a, we have the mentality over here. It's like, it's like give me. What can, I, what, what can you give me? Give, give. I'm just a taker. Over here in the hood, I'm a taker. Whatever you got for me, I'll take it. I'll take it, I'll take it, I'll take it. And I'll use you in order to get something from you. Okay? I, I, I'm a, it's, a, it's over here, it's a, it's a standard of survival. So I'm going to get what I can, can what I get, and sit on the can. Okay? It's all about what I can get. Okay? But when God transfers us out of the hood, moves us into the household of faith over here in God's hood, let me tell you what the standard of living looks like. Give. Give. How can I give? How can I share? How can I bless somebody else? How many know, church, that God wants to bless you to be a blessing? Why does God want to grace you? Yes, for your own health and well-being, but beyond that, he wants to grace you in order that you might be a blessing and a representative of the new standard of living, which is giving things away. I'm here to give. I'm here to serve. I'm here to help. I'm here to make your life better. That's what God wants to do in your life. So God's standard of living is give and give away. Watch in, in John chapter one. Let me explain this a little bit more through this verse of scripture. In John chapter one, verse 14, verses 16 and 17. And the word, speaking of Jesus, became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory as the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Jesus came to earth as a son of God. He left heaven in order to come and represent the Father on the earth. How did he represent the Father? Full of grace and truth. That was his standard of life, uh, lifestyle, his living. John the, or the, the, John the Baptist bore witness of him and cried out saying, this was he whom I said, he who comes after me is preferred before me for he was before me. Look at verse 16. And of his fullness, speaking of Jesus, of his fullness, we have all received. Catch that. Because what Jesus came to do is to represent God to man, but he also came to represent man to God. And all that God gave him to, to, to receive, he wants to impart in you. All that I received, all the fullness of God, we have all received, and watch this, and grace for grace. That means that all the fullness that Jesus came bearing in order to impart that into you freely, that grace has been given to you for grace to be given away. Church, we have got to get to this understanding that we are not, we have got to break selfishness off of our lives. It is not about how much you can just get for yourself. It's about understanding the grace of free, the free grace of God that God imparts in you by faith in order to empower you in order to be a witness for him and give it away. He gives us grace for grace. So as we understand so far that first of all, we must acknowledge this, that 
all that I have in Christ, all that we are as Christians, is by the grace of God. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15 verse 10, by the grace of God, I am who I am. We need to just say that right now out loud, everybody. Say this with me. By the grace of God, I am who I am. None of us, that's why, I love that. That's why, for second, sorry, Ephesians chapter two, verse eight and nine, I quoted it earlier, but listen to this verse again. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourself. It's a gift of God, that's free. Not of yourself, it's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. You can't boast in your own works. You can't stand up and say, man, look at all that I've done and all that I am. I am the man. Yeah, let me in, Jesus. I deserve to go to heaven. No, you don't. You deserve to go to hell. But by the grace of God, you get to go to heaven. You can't boast in your own works can't boast in your own ability. You're, you don't, you're not good enough. Neither am I. Nobody is. It's a free gift. And so all that I am, I am by the grace of God. But equally to that point, we need to acknowledge this, that by the grace of God, we do what we do. So I am what I am by the grace of God, but I do what I do by the grace of God. That's humility. And I want to talk about that a little bit more today, and I'm going to wrap up this series on that point. Humility, let's talk about it. Humility is a willingness to admit our needs and submit and surrender our will to God for our benefit and for the benefit of others. That's my definition. Humility is a willingness to admit our need. It's a willingness to say, I need God, I can't do life on my own. And not only that, I need others in my life as well because there's things that they can do that I can't do, that they know that I don't know. So I need to surround myself with God and I need to surround myself with other people and acknowledge the fact that I am weak in myself. But that's what humility identifies. Humility is coming to a place of saying, it's not all about me. You know, God hates pride. Pride is the opposite of humility, but pride has an independent attitude. Pride is, pride says, I don't need other people. In my, I can figure it out on my own. I can do life up by myself. I don't need you to tell me what to do. Pride says, I, I'm the man. I'm, I'm the most important. It's all about me. That's what pride is. Pride is an attitude of, of, of selfishness. That's what pride really is. Pride is a self-promotion. Pride is a self-exaltation. Pride is a self-centeredness. That's what pride is. And God hates it. God hates pride. As a matter of fact, that's the very thing that caused Satan to fall. Or Lucifer before his name was called Satan. Look at Isaiah chapter 14. We see in the scripture, in Isaiah 14, verses 12 to 15, the story of how Lucifer ended up falling. Um, for maybe some of you don't know this, but Satan, his name was Lucifer. He was actually created as an archangel in heaven before he fell, um, before he lost his position, before he was stripped of his glory, before he was, he was cast out of heaven. And of course, we know that the devil is still on the prowl today, but he's been dethroned and defeated by Jesus, right? And so, but before he, he did, before he fell, his name was Lucifer, and he was this archangel in heaven created by God to be this worship leader in heaven. He was created, that Ezekiel 28 tells us, he was created with this glory of, of, of th this inbuilt symphony. Everywhere he went, music emanated from him. He led the hosts of heaven in worship unto God. And he got to that place where he just said, you know what, why is everybody directing their attention on God when look at who beautiful I am, look at how wonderful I am. Why aren't I getting some of this glory? Why am I not getting some of the attention? So look at what Isaiah 14 verse 12 to 15 says, how you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. How you are cut down to the ground, you who weakened the nations. For you have said in your heart, watch, watch the pride here, I will ascend into heaven. 
I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north. And I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. And I will be like the most high. Okay, that's pride. And church, before we start pointing fingers and saying, yeah, bad devil. How many of us think sometimes I will choose my own life? I will determine where I want to go, what I want to do, who I want to live with, what I want to eat, what I want to drink, where I want to work. I will be in control of my life. I am my God. Nobody can tell me what to do. Pride. And God hates it. And God said this in verse 15, yet you shall be brought down to Sheol, which is a place of the dead, to the lowest depths of the pit. So that attitude does not work with me because there's only one God. And I found out a long time ago, I don't make a good God. I make a terrible God. I make some really bad choices and really bad decisions and I do really stupid things and I hurt other people. And I'm a bad, in myself, I'm a bad God. And I began to realize that there's only one God and he's the creator of who I am and creator of the universe and everything in it. And he's got a plan and he's got a purpose for my life and I'm willing to surrender and submit to that plan and purpose for my life. God will take me and he will move me up. He will exalt me. You know, the scripture says this, Promotion doesn't come from the east or the west. Promotion comes from the Lord. If you want to get ahead in life, if you want to get further in your, in your marriage, if you want to get further in your home life, in your workplace, if you want to get further along in society, submit and surrender and be humble before God. God will take you places that you never thought you could ever achieve on your own because you can't on your own. But God makes a way where there seems to be no way. God will open up doors that no man can close. God's got a plan and a destiny for your life, but he only honors the humble. Matter of fact, the Bible says humility precedes honor. Let me give you some other verses of scripture here. Psalm 147, verse six. The Lord lifts up the humble, but he casts the wicked down to the ground. James 4, verses six and 10. But God gives more grace. Therefore, he says, God resists the, the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he will lift you up. What you need to appreciate about humility is, church, you have to do it yourself. Don't ask God to humble you. You humble yourself. Humble yourself. Scripture says, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God, and in due season, he will exalt you. He will, he will lift you up. That's 1 Peter 5, verse 6. Psalm 25, verse 9. The humble he guides in justice, and the humble he teaches his way. The humble are people that are willing to be taught. They're teachable. You show me a proud man, he's unteachable. You show me a humble person, they're teachable. And God can teach, God can correct, God can instruct. And church, we need to get to that place of humility in our lives that we're willing to submit to the counsel of God and say, God, not my will, but yours be done. Lord, what is it? How is it that you want me to change my life in order to get me from where I used to be to where I need to be? Humility. Humility. Humility says, God, I can't do it on my own strength. I don't have the effort or the energy or the strength or the wisdom or the riches to be able to get out of where I am right now. But God, I know that you do. And so I surrender and I yield to you. And God will make, God, listen, it, just because you humble yourself doesn't mean that God's just gonna snap his fingers and make all your problems go away instantly. But what God will do is he'll put in motion the process for you to get out of where you are to where you need to be. He'll bring the right people across your path. He'll give you words of wisdom to be able to make proper and right choices and right decisions. He's gonna start giving you favor. Why? Because God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. What is grace? Unmerited favor to enable you to do what you can't do for yourself. See, church, the key to operating in this amazing grace is humility. Psalm 149, verse four, for the Lord takes pleasure in his people. He will beautify the humble with salvation. One last verse, Isaiah 57, verse 15, for thus says the high and lofty one, God, who inhabits the eternity, that's God, whose name is holy, we're talking about God, I dwell in the high and holy place with him who has a contrite and humble spirit to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. You know, there's times in my own personal life that, 
you know, I wasn't a Christian all my life. I, I got saved when I was 15 years old. I came from a home that was very ungodly. We didn't go to church as a family, didn't talk about Jesus in our home, didn't pray, didn't read the Bible. I don't even think we had a Bible in our home, but it was just, it was just everybody for themselves. It was, it was a selfish life. It was, what can you give me? And I remember just giving my life to Jesus and realizing that Man, God's got a different economy. God's, a, God's got a different standard of living. He's got a different way of doing things. And I began to realize in order to go up, I've got to go down. I realized that in order to get, I've got to give. I, I realized that the whole economy of heaven is com the complete reciprocal of this world. See, the world has the attitude of, I, I want to get, I do what I need to do to step on whoever I need to step on to get what I need to get. We try to exalt ourselves and promote ourselves and make ourselves our name known among others and do whatever we need to scratch and claw at success. And God says, no, 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 don't do that. Humble yourself, go down, serve others, give, and it will be given unto you. Good measure pressed down and shaken over. Will it be given into your bosom? For this, with the same measure that you use, it will be measured back to you. And God began to show me that in order for me to get ahead in life, for, in order for me to succeed in my, in my relationships and in my finances and, and in just experiencing the joy of God, I needed to get myself out of the way. Church, too many of us are in our own way of our progress, of our success. You know, the worst, your worst enemy is not the devil. I've said this so many times in this church. Your, en the worst, your worst enemy is not Satan. Your worst enemy is selfishness. If you can just get self out of the way and humble yourself and come before God and lay yourself down before him, and I'm talking about an attitude of the heart. I'm talking about a, pro, a, a position of your heart. You're willing to submit to God and say, God, I'm tired of trying to do this all on my own strength. I'm tired of trying to live it my own way, do my, make my own choices and my own decisions and do things by myself. I'm tired of doing that because it's not working. But Lord, I surrender to you and I submit to you and I come under your mighty hand. What does that mean? I come under your authority. I come under the authority of your word. What does your word say about that? Oh, in order to receive, I've got to give first? Okay. Listen, if you want somebody to forgive you, start forgiving others. If you want financial prosperity in your life, start tithing. Start giving. Start giving us away what you've got. Well, I don't know if I can afford to. You can't afford not to. If you want to get out of where you're stuck, you got to start giving yourself away. You got to start getting self out of the way and surrendering and submitting under the mighty hand of God. And God says, that's the kind of person I can grace. That's the kind of person that's going to receive from me. And that's the kind of person I can use. I'm going to promote you. If you want, listen, if you want to be blessed, be a blessing. Amen. Be a blessing. Why does God want to bless you? To be a blessing? Yeah. Why does God want to grace you? So that you can give your grace away. You can begin to help and serve other people. But when you do that, church, I'll tell you what God says, that's the kind of person I can use. I got so much more in store for you. And he begins to build you up and strengthen you and, 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 and just enforce his grace and strength and love and provision in your life. Man, my life is nothing like it used to be. I am so blessed in God because I learned how to get deeny, little deeny, weeny, deeny out of the way. <laughs> I'm not God. And I'm tired of trying to be him. And I surrender and I submit to God and God says, okay, son, here we go. Let's do this. And it begins to heal me from the inside out and begin to patch up the, the wounds and the scars and, 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 and the disappointing, discouraging times of my life and erase them from my memory and just to help me with forgiveness and love and mercy and grace because I received that from God, I can now give it away. Humility is the key to engaging in God and his grace. He wants you to engage in him in order so that you can receive his grace to engage in others. And that's where I want to take this to, to wrap this all up. God graces you. God blesses you in order that you can engage in others and be a blessing to them. 
Again, I want to remind you of 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 10. It's one of the primary verses that we've been using lately. As each one has received a gift, minister it. In other words, serve it to one another. You received to serve. You're blessed to be a blessing. You've been given in order to give away. As good stewards or good managers, that's what that word means, of the manifold grace of God. Now watch what it goes on to say, because we've stopped there in the past, but watch this. If any, it goes on to say in verse 11, if anyone speaks, let him speak as an oracle of God, and let him who ministers, let him do it as with the ability which God supplies. God's not going to ask us to do something in our own strength. He's going to ask us to do something that requires his strength. And just when we think we can't do it and we argue with God and we say, God, you're going to have to pick somebody else and I'm not going to do that. That's uncomfortable. That's inconvenient. That's going to cost me something. God says, no, 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 no. You don't understand. I've given you grace in order to ask you to do what I've, got, or to do what I've asked you to do. If I've asked you to go and forgive somebody, it's because I've already forgiven you. And because you've experienced my grace of forgiveness, now you have the grace in you to be able to forgive somebody else with the ability which God supplies. Look at Hebrews 12, 28. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us have grace by which we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. God graces you to be gracious. One of the greatest examples in scripture, I'm gonna wrap up with this example and I wanna give you three points to this. So I gotta go quick. But one of the greatest examples in scripture that we have of humility in action is Jesus. I mean, I could pick some other people from the Bible, but this is is the the great one. Jesus modeled humility. In Matthew 11, verse 28 to 30, I know I'm giving you a lot of verses of scripture here, but I think that's okay. Matthew 11, 28 to 30, come to me, Jesus said, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. I just need to stop there for a second because some of you are really burdened. You're heavy laden. You're struggling in life. Maybe it's a marriage situation and your marriage is not doing very well right now. Maybe it's with your kids. Uh, Maybe it's a work situation. You're not working. You're looking for a job. You're whatever. You're going through difficult time right now. Jesus is saying this, come and learn from me. Okay, this is what he's saying. He's saying, those who are burdened and heavy laden, come and I will give you rest. Look at verse 29. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and lowly in heart. Let me modernize that for you. I am gentle and humble. That's what Jesus is saying. But he said, but you need to come and learn from me. If you want to get out of your trial, if you want to get out of your pressure situation, if you want to get out of that problem that you're dealing with, learn from me. So here's what they would do. In the olden days, as a farmer, farming the land, um, unlike today, we've got these modern big tractors, right? (laughs) You know, farmers get in their tractor, they just punch in the position GPS you know, they got automated stuff nowadays. I mean, the farmer just basically, they don't even have to sit in the cab. They just let their, 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 their tractors just go up and down the field. But if they want to sit in there, they can sit in a nice air-conditioned cab and watch the game while they're chewing on some sandwiches and, you know, sitting back, feet up, and let the tractor just do the work. Awesome. Great. Now, I'm not a farmer, so I'm hopefully... <laughs> any farmers in the house? If you have a vehicle like that, that's awesome. Way to go. I'm not, I'm not in any way criticizing that. But in the olden days, back in the day when they used to have animals to pull the plow... Right? They would have an ox. They'd have a couple oxen working together. But what Jesus was using was an illustration that, hey, what they would do to train the younger, weaker ox is they would take that younger one and they would yoke it with a strong, mature ox. One that had already done the work several times. Strong. And be able to be able to pull that plow along. And the younger one would just kind of walk alongside the older one and watch how the older one's doing it, basically letting the older one pull the weight until it got strong enough and understood what its role was and it would cooperate and work with the older one. But Jesus said this, hey, you that are burdened and heavy laden, hey, come and be yoked with me for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Listen, I'm gonna do the heavy lifting, but here's what you need to do. Learn from me. Learn from me. What do we learn? From, what are we learning from Jesus? He's gentle and he's humble. 
And when we humble ourselves, like Jesus humbled himself, we can walk alongside him and he can do the heavy lifting for us. But too many of us don't want to yoke up with Jesus. We want to do our own thing. I got it all figured out on my own. I can do it my way. Well, have fun plowing because it's going to be a lot of work. But when you come alongside Jesus, he can pull the weight. We need to appreciate that. Now, Philippians chapter 2, 5 to 11. Here's another example of Jesus' humility. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation. Jesus, this is, this is the Son of God. And we appreciate the fact that Jesus, or sorry, the Son of God, okay, he, he, he left the realms of eternity. He's God, the Son of God, part of the Trinity of God, but he left the realms of heaven to come in the form of humanity. So here's what it says, that he did not consider Robert to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. A bondservant, by the way, church, real quickly, a bondservant, unlike a, just a normal servant, is a bondservant willingly serves. It, it, it's, it, the term is re, uh, derived from where a servant or a slave used to be a slave of a master's house, but when he was released from the master, he had a choice whether or not he wanted to stay with the family or whether he wanted to leave and move on. A bond servant was somebody who willingly submitted himself back to the household of his master and said, I love you and I want to serve you. And when that happened, the, the servant received a piercing in his ear that marked him as a bond servant of that household. But he was there willingly because he loved the master. And Jesus became a bond servant. He willingly Loving the master, loving the father, he willingly submitted and surrendered his will to the father to say, I will serve you in this way. And by the way, serving God is serving you. So Jesus, he humbled himself that way. And, and watch, in coming in the likeness of man, look at verse eight, Philippians two. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. So Jesus surrendered his will to the Father and saying, I will go in the place of mankind to take your wrath upon me. The wrath that you had appointed for man, I'm going to take it for them. And I'm going to die in their place, willingly. Watch verse 9. Therefore God, the Father, also has highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of those on the, in heaven, those on earth, and those under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Remember, humility precedes exaltation. Humility precedes promotion. Humility precedes elevation. And Jesus humbled himself. Great example. Let me take, you, let me take three traits to share with you from that story especially verse eight. Let me read that again. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself, became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Okay, let me take three points for that. A, humility serves others with the grace that we've received. Humility serves others. Taken the form of a bondservant. That tells us right there that Jesus humbled himself to serve others. Now, I want to just encourage you with that, church, again, because if you just take this message or take this series and think, okay, this is all about me getting God's power for me, you're only halfway there. Because, again, the power of God that God has for you is not just for yourself. You're blessed to be a blessing. You're graced to be gracious. Right? You're helped to be helpful. God wants you to take what he's given you. So look at 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 2 to 4. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our tribulation, all our problems, that we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. Here's what God is saying. Listen. Listen. You might be going through a bad addiction. Um, and you look to God for his grace to help you break that addiction. And God helps you overcome. God helps you 
break that. God helps you become delivered from that problem. But now because God's graced you with his transformational grace to help you through your problem, and you now have been healed, God now expects you to take what you've gone through and the grace that you've experienced to go help somebody else that might be going through that same problem. Help somebody else. Whatever you've been delivered from or healed from, go find somebody else that has gone through that or going through that so that the grace that God has given you can be released through you to touch that person's life. I find some of the most amazing testimonies of people who have been healed of cancer, praying for other people who are, that have cancer and seeing them healed because of the grace of God on their lives for their healing, they now have the ability to release that to touch somebody else. Let me break it down for all of us to understand. Listen, if God has saved you, you've experienced the redemptive grace of God, he's saved you, you know Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior, guess what God expects you to do with that grace? Share it. Tell somebody else that Jesus loves them and that God came for them just as much as he did for you. He laid his life down for them. Just this past week, and this is, I, just this past week, I, I teach a class on Wednesday evening called Fresh Start. It's usually for new believers that come to church. And it's just helping them get on, started in their walk with God. And, uh, and all of the people that are usually there are those, they're saved, they're believers, they just wanna grow in their faith. Well, after the class was over, one lady came up to me afterwards and she said, I've never prayed that prayer of salvation before. Would you pray that prayer with me? And so I said, yeah. So I, I led her in that prayer and I prayed for her. Well, before I actually prayed for her, there was another lady that overheard her say that and she said, oh, by the way, I want that prayer too. And I said, wow, okay, yeah, let's do that. And so I thought, do you mind? Because we were talking about water baptism. I said, do you mind if we pray with other people hearing this and seeing this, because again, we're not to be ashamed of being a follower of Christ. She, and they said, yeah, yeah, not a problem. So I called the whole class out and we said, we're gonna pray for these two individuals that just decided they wanna give their lives to Jesus. And then as soon as I said that, there was another lady that came out of the crowd and said, oh, can I be included in that prayer too? I wanna give my life to Jesus. <laughs> so three people on Wednesday night gave their life to Christ. Now, yeah, amen. But not only that, just this morning after this first service, speaking about how we need to give away what we've received, the lady came up to me, another lady came up to me, another lady said, said I, um, I, I need to turn my life around. I said, great, have you given your life to Jesus yet? She said, no. And I said, do you want to? She said, yes. So just this morning, another person just gave their life to Christ. I'm saying that simply to say, church, people right now are starving for life. They're starving for answers. They're starving for purpose. And you and I have been graced with this redemptive grace of Jesus Christ. Let's not keep it to ourselves. People are hungry for what you have to give them. If only we could say, listen, I've got what you need. And it's as simple as just believing and receiving. Do you want to receive that right now? Yes, 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 yes. I've been through a bad marriage. We worked it out. Do you want me to help you with yours? Yes. I've got disobedient children that I've grown up and raised up by the grace of God. They're great. They turned out wonderful. Can I help you with yours? Yes. Amen. Over and over again. I've been sick. I was plagued. I was diseased. The doctor said I only have a few months left, but God healed me by his grace. Can I pray for you? Yes. But every time I see people be willing to turn around and help somebody else with the grace that they've experienced, almost 100% of the time, the anointing of God is on their life to touch that other life. And every one of us, church, has experienced the grace of God in some way, shape, or form that God's expecting us to give it away. Give it away. Give it away. So, humility serves others. Amen. If you've been, how many of you have been forgiven? Forgive others. Forgive others. Yes, you can. Well, I can't do that. You don't know what they did. Hey, I don't need to know what you did, but I know that it was bad enough to send you to hell and Jesus forgave you. So if Jesus forgave you and me, I think, we, I think we can turn around and forgive other people. Amen? Yeah, as a matter of fact, the scripture actually tells us to do that. Let me give you that verse. Ephesians 4, 32, and be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, just as God in Christ forgave you. Okay, secondly, quickly, humility serves others simply out of obedience to God. 
simply out of obedience to God. Remember Jesus in Philippians 2, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death. I'm almost done, I promise. Humil- I promise. Humility serves others simply out of obedience. So there are times, church, that you have received by grace the change and transformation in your life, and now you can turn around and dispense that grace into somebody else's life. But there are times where, you know, you may not have experienced some problems in some situations, but it doesn't stop you from helping somebody else. Let me, let me just say it this way. A doctor doesn't need to have a kidney problem in order to do an operation on somebody who does, Right? They can be trained, they can be equipped, they can be graced, if you will, in a certain area that they're able to help other people without having to go through it themselves. Okay, let me give you an example in scripture. It's called the Macedonian churches up in the northern part of Greece. Modern day Greece, there's a number of churches that the Apostle Paul ended up reaching and touching. Of course, we have the Corinthian church down at the southern part towards the Mediterranean Sea, that part of Greece. But then you've got the northern part of Greece, which was called Macedonia. And the churches that Paul reached in those areas were Philippi, Thessalonica, and a church that you probably don't recognize very well, but it's another church that Jesus, or sorry, that Paul ministered to. It was called Berea. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 1 to 5, here's what the Apostle Paul says. Moreover, brethren, we make known to you the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia, that in a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and in their deep poverty, okay, now they're experiencing deep poverty here, okay? They're, they're, they're experiencing an economic problem, right? And, and, they're, and financially, they weren't very rich or well off, all right? So they, weren't, they didn't have a ton of money. But watch what Paul goes on to say, that in their deep poverty, they abounded in the riches of their liberality. For I bear witness, and I testify is what he's saying, that according to their ability, yes, and beyond their ability. How many know what that means? Grace. Not just their ability, but beyond their ability. Remember what grace is? God's ability to make up for our inability, right? So beyond their ability or the grace of God, they were freely willing to be liberal in sharing, imploring us with much urgency that we would receive the gift and the fellowship of the ministering to the saints. And not only as we had hoped, but they first gave themselves to the Lord and then to us by the will of God. So here's Paul describing these Macedonian churches, simply saying this, that in their poverty, they joyfully gave out of the grace of God liberally to help me as a minister of the gospel. So you don't have to wait to have it all together before you start helping other people. You don't have to wait to have a million dollars in your bank account before you start giving. I just know this church, and I've learned this a long time ago, that if I have a need, sow a seed. If I, if I have a need, give. Give something away. Start helping somebody else because what you make happen for others, God will make happen for you. When you start giving out of your lack, when you start thinking, I can't afford to, is the time when you have to say, I can't afford not to. If I need God to grace me and help me, give. And the Bible says, it will be given back to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over. See, God's economy is completely different than the world's economy. The world's economy says that, well, if it's convenient and it's comfortable and I've got enough and I'm not going to miss it, if I give it away, then I'll give. God's economy says, no, 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 no. My grace is sufficient for you. I'm able to supply all your needs according to my riches and glory. How many know that you belong to the household of faith, the the house of God, where your father is the father of of all? Here, listen. Your father owns the universe. He doesn't have any lack or of anything. So when you give by grace in obedience to what God's asked you to do, listen to me, church, you will never run out. God will supply all your needs according to his riches and glory. Give. Listen, a garden hose waters the plants, but it can't help but get wet when it does. If you want to get wet, water somebody. Okay, I know my time is really spent here, so I'm trying to wrap up quickly. Um, But we got to get to that place, church, that we're willing to obey God whenever he says, do it, go, go, do. And we're willing to get outside of ourselves, get a little weenie-deenie out of the way and start obeying God. Start doing what he's asking you to do and watch the favor of God. The last point I want to give you is C, humility sacrifices for others. Philippians 2.8, Jesus humbled himself, 
became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. How many know that God's grace cost him something? God's grace cost him something. It didn't cost you anything. You were simply received that by faith. Now, as a believer and follower of Jesus, God's going to ask you to do certain things to help other people. And guess what? It's going to, have to, it's going to cost you something, but it's free for the next person. It's paying it forward. You ever been through a Tim Hortons or a McDonald's or somewhere and you're going through the drive-thru and somebody ahead of you paid for your coffee for them? Did you pay it forward? Or would you just say, I'll take that one. That's awesome, man. I got another free thing. It's great. Free. Free. Well, I'll take whatever you can give me. Or are we willing to give it away? Because we've been blessed. That's the economy of heaven. That's what God wants us to do. That's the grace that God wants us to walk in. But it's, it's going it's, it's to, it's sacrificial obedience. Matthew chapter 10, I'm going to close with this verse of scripture and I promise you I'm done. Matthew 10, verses 1 and verses 5 to 8. When Jesus had called his 12 disciples to him, he gave them power over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all kinds of sickness and all kinds of disease. They didn't earn that. They didn't deserve that. God just blessed them and graced them with that ability. Hallelujah. And by the way, he does that for you too because you've got the Holy Spirit, the same Holy Spirit that can do miracles lives inside of you. These 12 Jesus sent out and commanded them saying, do not go into the way of the Gentiles and do not enter the city of the Samaritans. Again, it wasn't the time for the gospel to be preached yet to the Gentiles. That happened later. But at this time, he's telling them to go to the household or the house of Israel. Go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, verse six. Verse seven, and as you go, preach saying, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out demons, forgive those that, are, that, are, that hurt you. I mean, I, I'm adding on to this, but I want you to get the point. Bless other people. Freely you have received. Freely give. Start giving away what you've been given. And it's going to cost you inconvenience. It might not be pleasant. It might even cost you some money, some property, some rest. But because you've received the grace of God, start giving that away. And other people's lives will be touched and blessed and impacted to the point where they will also want to give their lives to Jesus Christ. Where they come into relationship with God and make home their home in heaven for eternity. Simply because we've been willing to help and serve other people. I love it when I see the church serving other people getting out of their comfort zones, setting up tables in the park and giving away free shoes, helping people in the soup kitchens, clothing the naked and the, and the wounded and the, and the hurting and the lost and helping people in, in this world that need a touch from God, helping marriages that are struggling and helping homes get healed in their parentings with their kids and just doing what we can to touch the neighbor around us with God's love because he first loved us. And church, when we begin to do that, watch the kingdom of God. Watch this world get so revolutionized by the power of God. If we want to see our world change, let's be the change that our world needs. Let's make it happen. Can we stand together? Let's close this series off with a prayer. As we dedicate our lives to Jesus, we say, Lord God, I am sorry that I have held on to all the freebies that you've given me. And I recognize, Lord, that they were not just for me. I recognize today, Lord, that the grace of God is for others. And therefore, Lord, as I engage in you for your grace, I also engage in others to release your grace. I engage in you to receive your grace, but I engage in others to release your grace. And so, Lord, because of freely I've received, Lord, freely I give. I want to serve other people, touch other people, love on other people, people that you loved 
that you died for them. Help me, Lord God. I surrender my will to you. I give my life to you. Take my life and use it for your glory. And help me to be that gracious blessing for somebody else. In the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Church, I love you. God loves you. And I just know collectively as a church, we're going to see some great things. God bless you. Go your way rejoicing in the Lord. We look forward to seeing you throughout the week. Hey, thanks for watching. For more content, hit subscribe and make sure to follow us on social media. You can also visit championcitychurch.com for more information.